back in 1994, I met Attorney General Mike Moore, who was the Attorney General for Mississippi, in a youth empowerment event for tobacco control youth advocates in Atlanta, Georgia. He filed a lawsuit on behalf of the state of Mississippi and sued the tobacco companies for the loss that Mississippi was suffering from because there were so many Medicaid and and Medicare individuals that were dying and suffering from diseases related to tobacco. That then led to a class action suit that Indiana became party of. My background in the issue began when I was a Deputy Attorney General for Attorney General Jeff Modisett from 1997 through 2000. And uh, uh, Attorney General Modisett was very aggressive in joining the other attorney generals in the litigation against the tobacco industry in the late 90s. Uh, and he became quite an advocate for the use of funds that, that came as a result of the national settlement. Well, the first thing is the interest in the legislature to receive money from the master tobacco settlement. I was involved with that and served with uh, Attorney General Modisett, um on their suit, Indiana's suit against the tobacco industry. So I was involved in that. And then out of that came discussions among legislators to um, set up a novel mechanism to receive those monies and address the problem of tobacco in Indiana. We made a determination with the support of the uh, governor uh, and legislative leadership that the uh, master tobacco settlement dollars would go for health-related purposes. My partner in crime, Senator Borst at that point, was very, very cooperative. Uh, in fact, I often teased him that prior to us ending uh, the, the process of, of determining what we would present to both chambers, that I would have him uh, wearing an earring and uh, wearing a beard. Uh, and everyone was fully aware of Senator DeVos's very dry humor. And, uh, so, uh, uh, and we called one another brother at that point when we were really down to the nuts and bolts of crafting the final piece of, piece of legislation. It was a huge step and in a lot of ways, Indiana at that time quickly became a leader in a model of how to spend the funds wisely and also spend them appropriately on the use from which those lawsuits were engaged. Many other states had used it for roads and uh, filling holes in their budgets or whatever, but we were able to get consensus that we would devote 100% of the Indiana uh, return uh, revenue to uh, healthcare. At that point, I think we were the only state that dedicated all of the money, the tobacco settlement money, to uh, health care. But with that kind of a commitment, then it was an easy chore and uh, to set up various elements. Some of it, some of the dollars went to the uh, State Board of Health. Um, some of the dollars went into the Hoosier RX program. Uh, there were other programs and then obviously uh, went to uh, ITPC for uh, counter-marketing. We had a small grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to work on educating policymakers and educating the public about how this money should be used. And so I had been working with our voluntary organizations, our voluntary health organizations here in and Indiana to do that. Then the opportunity uh, came along that we actually were forming a new agency. I was first appointed to the board and then hired uh, by the board chairman to be the executive director, something that I never really thought was uh, going to happen when we were in the beginning working so hard just to get the money appropriated to tobacco. Well, I started out there at the very same time that Carla Sneegas started. She was executive director. I was named deputy director and general counsel. And together, we were the first two staff members, paid staff members, to serve the needs of the board uh, that had been established by the General Assembly and the governor to oversee the distribution and program development for a system, a statewide tobacco prevention and cessation program, which really in Indiana we had not had up to that point 
setting up the independent agency uh, as opposed to putting it in the health department. Uh, our thinking was that the health department had its mission and its mandate to deal with a number of other issues. We needed someone who had that focused look. They didn't want responsible for education, wasn't responsible for fixing up roads and streets, was simply to counter market the advertising dollars that the tobacco industry was spending, convincing people to smoke, particularly young people, to smoke, and to give us the opportunity to have an even playing field. One of the big successes of this program in the very beginning was a dedication by Carla and, uh, and Bain Ferris and myself that we, we, would, we would take the community development funds and we would dedicate funds for every county of the state of Indiana in some way. We built a really strong coalition here locally and couldn't have done that had we not had the professional training and the help from ITPC in developing and training our team here locally. We have like a web in this state where all these little local coalitions all work together on the same priority, and that's helping Hoosiers quit smoking and reducing exposure to secondhand smoke. We're all talking the same language so that we can make a bigger impact. Public and private partnerships has always been at the heart of good tobacco control work, and so from the beginning we set out to develop partnerships. Now, as we moved along, it became apparent that there were some partnerships that we wanted to develop that had had a relationship in the past with the tobacco industry. We were able, because of the settlement funding, to be able to offer to them an opportunity to make a change and to make a really profound change. The African American community has been targeted by the tobacco industry for years and Indiana Black Expo had the opportunity to make that change by working together with us and by severing their ties with the tobacco companies. For um, various years now, Indiana Black Expo has had a, a great partnership with ITPC. Um, maybe 10 years ago or so, Indiana Black Expo used to take tobacco dollars. They used to be a big time sponsor of our events because it was one of their efforts to reach the African American community. And I know under Reverend Williams' leadership, he decided for the organization with the board of directors that approved that, the Indiana Black Expo from a health standpoint, because that tied into our very mission, to stop taking tobacco dollars and really partner um, with ITPC with respect to education on tobacco prevention and cessation. It definitely got the attention of many national organizations that Indiana Black Expo was willing to step up, make that change, and it was a new day for them. Most of us that were staff with the agency had been participants with the Indiana State Fair from the time we were kids. So we were really aware of how being at the Indiana State Fair really shapes Hoosier attitudes and you know really what it what it means to really be a Hoosier. We started nine years ago with a grant to the Indiana State Fair to have a, a very, very large presence. And since that time, uh, we've had a presence right outside of the grandstand, right on Main Street, and we have talked with literally millions of Hoosiers. Well, we had always uh, wanted to be able to do much more than what you think about in terms of traditional tobacco prevention and cessation. We really wanted this funding to leverage profound change at the community level. Our board members are, uh, have always had youth prevention as a central part of, of our mission. Uh, when we've gone through tough times uh, with uh, having to make adjustments because of funding, uh, we've always remained very consistent with making sure that the youth prevention elements remained in place. The tobacco industry is targeting us. They know if they can get us hooked on their addictive products while we're young, 
they'll reap huge profits for years to come. And when the tobacco industry hits their target, we lose. <laughs> Voice.tv, have your say. One of the first things that we did was to pull together a group of young people who wanted to make a difference in Indiana. I was part of the first statewide summit. It was unreal. It's something I, I'd never seen before. We had hundreds of kids uh, that came around from all around the state to uh, downtown Indianapolis. We brainstormed, we educated ourselves and our peers about uh, Big Tobacco, about their deceptive marketing tactics. We were making posters, we were uh, building signs, we were trying to come up with creative ways to spread our message. We had fake body bags representing the number of people killed every year in Indiana from tobacco-related deaths. But we marched towards the circle with it. I have a very vivid memory of rounding that corner right by the monument. It was just this massive sea of people it was really cemented there in my mind that this was truly a youth-led movement. And we were, being given, we were given the power by ITBC and by voice to make our voices heard. We have a message for the tobacco industry. You don't give us a lot of credit. But we know what you're up to. You portray tobacco as independent and mature. So we'll think it's cool. But we know tobacco is a dangerous, addictive product that kills. 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 We know how you see us. But we're smarter than that. And now, we're fighting back against big tobacco. We think you'll find it a lot harder to hit a moving target. In talking with those folks now, uh, not only did they help make a difference in Indiana by improving health, by reducing youth smoking rates, but I'm finding out that we've made a difference in their lives by providing them with wonderful leadership opportunities that also have uh, helped them make career choices. And some of them are actually now back with us and working as coordinators in our local communities. I started when I was 16. When I was 18, I went to college and uh, enrolled for uh, communication and public relations. So it, uh, it truly, which is what I'm doing now, it truly shaped uh, my career thus far. And um, more than just the specific career, it really, it really gave me a voice that I'd never had before. It, it gave me a purpose. It made me feel like I was doing something that was going to make a difference. We're really excited that we've driven down the youth smoking rate for both high school and for middle school. Uh, I'm really uh, very, very proud of that. I'm very, very proud of the youth movement that we've built. So many of my friends growing up uh, had a cigarette in their hand or had uh, chewing tobacco in their pocket. Um, and it was, a, it was a pretty constant thing. And to know that my younger brothers and my younger cousins and eventually my kids will have a better smoke-free environment to grow up in than I did, is incredibly moving and humbling. Indiana is tough territory for reducing adult smoking. We uh, Hoosiers don't like to be told what to do. So this has been a, a really tough challenge for us, but we have made phenomenal success. In 2006, Indiana, for the first time, launched a population-based telephone quit line, the Indiana Tobacco Quit Line. What this enabled us to do was really take more of a population-based approach at helping tobacco users who are ready to quit, to be able to line up our media messages with a call to action, that there is a resource there, there is help there. Now we've taken that Indiana Tobacco Quit Line and we've made that the central part of a much more robust set of interventions that are targeted to healthcare providers, to employers, and to organizations who are wanting to get involved in promoting cessation to Hoosiers. From summer celebration standpoint, what we've tried to do is really come alongside from an operational standpoint and incorporate the messaging, the 1-800-QUIT line into everything that we really do. When we set out to build our program, the executive board wanted us to, as staff, to use an evidence-based approach. 
And the evidence is uh, very clear that hard-hitting media messages coupled with uh, a, a public education campaign at the community level will change people's social norms as it relates to tobacco. It'll change their attitudes, it'll change their beliefs, and you have to do that before you can actually get people to change their behavior. We're in a position to make a great deal of money here, gentlemen. What would you do if you found out your death was being planned? He's seizing! All right, let's do them now. By someone you've never even met. A whole lot of people are dying. A lot of other people are making money off of it. You just don't wipe out a population the size of Madrid and wake up and play golf the next day. Watch me. See what the critics are calling heart-stopping, positively addictive. He sees Let's it. do them now. It grabs a hold of you and won't let go. I have the death toll figures right here. This is the big dirt nap, man. An out-and-out out killer. Dude, you watch way too many movies. This is not a movie. Tobacco. Over 10,000 Indiana deaths a year and counting. It can't be a message that goes ignored. It has to make people uncomfortable, uh, and particularly if we're talking about a message where we're trying to move that smoker to the point where it's inescapable. It's time for them to quit. Every cigarette is doing you damage. This is part of an aorta, the main artery from the heart. Smoking makes artery walls sticky and collect dangerous fatty deposits. This much was found stuck to the aortal wall of a smoker, age 32. Every cigarette is doing you damage, so the sooner you quit, the better you'll be. When I grow up, when I grow up, I want to cough all the time. I want to have stained teeth and smelly clothes. I want my very own tank of oxygen. I want to have a stroke. High blood pressure. Cancer. Heart disease. I don't want to live to see my grandchildren. Just hurting myself isn't enough. I want to hurt everyone around me, too. I want to expose my kids to 4,000 deadly toxins and not give it a second thought. Yeah. Yeah, I want to be a smoker. The first ever public education campaign, which involved television, radio, newspaper, outdoor, really set the stage for our local coalitions in all of the 92 counties to start making a difference. The video that my husband had done with the local coalition was shared with me after he passed away. And I was inspired at his courage to share his story. When I do run, it's like I'm going through the scrapbook of our lives. Gary had challenged me to, to try to, to run Boston. I've been training since the day after his funeral. He was gonna quit smoking. It was too late. He needed to be in a wheelchair. The day before Gary went into the hospital, I took him on a walk and showed him my trail. I run at the cemetery now. I was pushing him along that trail. That was the best date we ever had. My life has been enriched for doing so. It's a tragedy that has been turned into a triumph for those who will quit smoking because of Gary's story. I got involved with doing the radio commercial because uh, I wanted to get my message out in more than one way. The radio seems to be the best way to reach everybody. Meet Molly. She didn't believe someone her age could get lung cancer. After smoking for only 10 years, Molly, at age 30, was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. When they told me I had cancer, it felt like a bomb was dropped on me. The first thing that went across my mind, I want to live. I was scared for my kids. I thought about them growing up without me. People are still looking for ways to calm their cravings for nicotine or whatever, but you know, the, the message is clear and um, people are starting to realize that, you know, what their habits are are not worth their lives. If we engage the public, engage providers, engage systems, engage employers, I, I mean, the, the data's clear. We'll have a difference, we'll make a difference as a group.
Indiana lawmakers are voting on whether to keep a controversial bill banning smoking in Indiana alive in the Senate. Now, that legislation, which has already cleared the House, appears to have hit a roadblock. Indiana will not have a statewide smoking ban for at least another year. A Senate committee voted the bill down today. When we opened the agency in 2001, we were not protecting any Hoosiers with comprehensive smoke-free air policies. Zero. There were a few policies in place, but they had a lot of loopholes in them. Uh, people at that time just didn't believe that secondhand smoke was something to be worried about. And you certainly didn't want to tell your friend or your neighbor or a coworker not to smoke around you. Changing those attitudes has been key to being able to even talk about policy change and to be in the position where we can actually work with policymakers to help them understand why it's so important for workers to be protected from secondhand smoke. Although grassroots efforts are great, um, that change comes from policy change. And so really looking at long term, you know, this is the best way to affect change in the state of Indiana and in Marion County. We're very strategic with our coalition in saying that the three hospitals that serve the county first, that the hospitals needed to adopt smoke-free workplace policy laws because you couldn't really go ask anybody else to do that if the health partners weren't leading the way. So Johnson Memorial Hospital led the way with that. Community Health Network and St. Francis all came on board with smoke-free workplace policy. Uh, they've worked on a number of voluntary policy efforts and all of this comes together to help build the momentum for an entire community uh, to decide it's time for all of our workers to be protected. 100% of the employees in Franklin are protected by smoke-free workplace policy law now, including bars, private clubs, restaurants. I went around the state and testified at a number of city council meetings and we were successful most of the time. We had a very good success rate uh, because it's, a, it's an easy issue. Once people are fully educated, uh, it's an easy issue to win. I mean, we're talking about the health of our fellow citizens. Even though there's a lot of substance behind that message, when you are able to leverage and bring in celebrities to help carry that message, um, our community happens to listen to it and to be more attentive to it. And so being able to have that leverage, also being able to have that voice in the community, to me, is critical. Well, to all the policymakers, I think it's really important for them to understand the uh, the really dangerous aspect of secondhand smoke. I tell them, look, you can't smoke, and they go, oh, we can't afford not to smoke. We can't afford to tell our patients. So we'll have a couple nights, and then we'll make the first six rows non-smoking. They obviously did not take high school science, because they know the composition of smoke. Smoke doesn't stop when it gets to the first six rows. Hey, hey, hold up. Molecules, back up. As a horn player, you know that to blow this thing, even though it looks like a toy, takes a lot of breath. So, um, you know, that if you're in a situation like this where there's no smoke, it's, it's much cleaner, much healthier. You can still smoke if you want to go outside or whatever. You can run outside real quick and then come back. <laughs> Indiana, stop being gut buckety. Please, get it together. We know that we need to get a lot of communities from the grassroots up, um, letting the legislators um, you know, success stories and, and how health has been improved. And then I'm confident that our state legislators will do the same. I'm really proud of the work that, that they've accomplished, but we can't slow down not one bit. Um, you know, the future is the ability for us to protect every single worker in this state from exposure to secondhand smoke. The evidence is clear. There is no possible way to protect against secondhand smoke other than to eliminate it from the indoor environment. And that's what we need to do in order to make Indiana a healthier place, in order to reduce costs for employers, and in order for us to really truly protect young people for the future. I wasn't aware that it has been 10 years. Uh, time goes by quickly and hopefully this will assist in getting more and more Hoosiers to understand and appreciate 
the work that has been done in this area and getting more to participate in keeping the ball rolling on minimizing tobacco use in the state of Indiana. I'm honored to be included in this and uh, I'm uh, in a celebratory mood over the 10 years and, uh, and uh, optimistic for the future. It takes about 10 years before your investments in a major program like this begin to take hold. So you can think of a little seedling out there. You've kind of plow the soil, a little bit of fertilizer, a little bit of water, and there's some little bitty roots now down in the ground. That's where we are at 10 years. And you know, little uh, fir trees and other kinds of trees, uh, they get into a, a rapid growth phase. And we're right at the edge of that rapid growth phase where over the next 10 years, I think we're going to make serious dents in the per capita rates, the adult rates, uh, and further reductions in the youth smoking issues. I think we made wonderful progress. Uh, not only do we have uh, bans in many cities around the state and a partial ban in Indianapolis, that's good progress. Uh, I think everybody worked hard. And um, we also have an educated populace. So polls today, are showing that, uh, that citizens of Indiana understand the ramifications of failure to pass a ban. And so there's a popular movement now that, that wasn't present 10 years ago. Number one, we've got to protect everyone at the workplace from secondhand smoke. Number two, I think that we've got to continue our media messages and combine that together with number three, which is our network of community partners across the state. Indiana is a very local control state, and it's really at the community level where people live, where they work, where they play, where they worship, that change happens. The uh, local ordinance that we had passed in 2006, even though it wasn't 100% smoke-free workplace ordinance, which we are working now to help make that happen, it helped um, fuel the other communities to pass their ordinances. And now we are all continuing to work towards having more communities with tobacco-free policies. And because of that, we will have hopefully a smoke-free state. We will continue to fight this effort, particularly with um, the strategies that the tobacco companies have now that are targeting our youth with respect to some of the new products that they have out in the market with Indiana being a test market. And so I think that the grassroots efforts are going to continue. Um, I think we're behind the ball. Indiana's behind the ball. Marion County is behind the ball with getting policies passed. So we can move away from that basic issue to, okay, now they're targeting our kids over here. So what do we need to do about it as a community? It is a significant public health issue. It continues to be, uh, it needs to be supported um, in order to be successful. And the long-term benefits for public health and society so far outweigh uh, any short-sighted uh, funding uh, concerns that it needs to continue. It has survived some very tough times to this date. So I know that there's support within uh, state government, the administration, and, and the legislatures for it. So I know it's a priority. I'm confident that 10 years from now, we're gonna look back and marvel at what Indiana has done in coming from one of the uh, really worst states in the country for tobacco, I hope, to one of the top tier. My hopes is 20 years from now, when some grandkid asks, somebody what the most important work they ever did was and they respond it was tobacco control that that young person may may even say what's tobacco